Welcome to Suffolk Library's Online Children's Book Festival. We're so delighted to be able to offer these awesome online events with brilliant authors, especially for those of you that don't find it easy to get to our libraries for in-person events. I'm Lisa, your host, and today I am totally thrilled and delighted, ecstatic to be joined by the brilliant children's author, Sophie Green. Hi, Sophie. Hello, hello. It's awesome. I'm, I'm going to start back in 2016. You were shortlisted for the Bath Children's Novel Award. How did that moment just change everything for you as an author? Um, it was amazing because I'd been shortlisted for another competition a few years before and, and I thought everything was going to change then and it kind of didn't afterwards. So when I first got um, longlisted, I kind of thought, mm, OK. And then I found out about the shortlisting and that the uh, shortlisting was done by children. And that was amazing because that meant so something I'd never really known before, which is that children did like my children's books, which is quite a big thing for an author and really, really important. And so I had a, that Christmas, I was I remember thinking, because that's when the children do the reading. Um, right now someone could be reading one of my books right, right now they could be at this part in the book and it's such a thrilling feeling and then I, I was at work at uh, Woodbridge Library when the results came in and they were literally up being uploaded to Twitter every few seconds and uh, it was nerve-wracking and I, I hadn't I didn't win we got the winner's announcement but within sort of minutes I got uh, contacted by two American eight two different American literary agencies so, you know, having spent so many years trying to find someone to be interested in my book, suddenly to kind of get that interest coming to me, was just fantastic. And I think as well, you also work, but a different workplace, when you got that first email saying, hey, we're going to offer you a book deal, a free yeah. book deal. So tell us yeah. about that and that celebratory walk home that you had. <laughs> yeah. Well, at the time I had a lot of... Uh, um, I quite often have soundtrack music and I had a lot of La La Land soundtrack music on my iPod and so if you've watched La La Land there's a great um, there's a great song in it which is right at the beginning where they are all dancing on top of cars and things so I was walking home from work that night having having had to keep it fairly quiet to myself at work um, I, I think I was actually on my own that day so there's no one to tell anyway and, uh, and then just walking home and hearing the song and feeling like I I could just burst into that dance like I was in a musical because I was so elated. So in my head, I was the, the sort of dream Sophie was in my head dancing along the street and I was just walking normally with a massive smile on my face. It's going, this is awesome. It's actually <laughs> yeah. happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it, it takes a little while, doesn't it? After that initial offer for everything to kind of be locked in. And um, you've I, I work with Sophie, I'm very lucky to, and she told us in an email, and you know, Sophie, I even remember where I was when I got that email. <laughs> I was so thrilled for you. I was in Stone Market for a meeting, like honestly, I was just like, this is awesome. And in that email, you said that Cole Mountford is going to be your illustrator. Now, that's someone who originally said he was too busy, and then he read your book. How awesome was that? It was incredible. I mean, it's really incredible because A, you don't normally, you don't always get an illustrator. That's a publisher decision. And um, they had decided they would pair me with an illustrator, which was like something of my dreams. And then they said they would try and get Carl James Mountford, but, um, or, or, or someone like him, they said. And I thought, yeah, yeah, someone like him because he's a very successful children's illustrator and, and one that I really love. Anyway, then it came, It turned out it was him they were trying to get, but he said he was too busy because um, he was doing projects of his own. And then they said that he'd read it and he loved it so much that even though he was really busy, he wanted to do it anyway. It's just amazing. I mean, he was, he's an amazing artist and he bought, you, you'll see from like the covers, just hold one up here. He, he, bought, whoop, he bought so much to these books in terms of his illustrations and he's like colour schemes. He said he based his colour schemes on 80 sweets. Um, which I just thought, yeah, it just looked, it was so good. Um, he, yeah, and so when the fact that he, I mean, illustrators are paid to illustrate books, so it's a business decision for them, but makes a huge difference when somebody really loves a project, to me anyway, and uh, to know that he loved it was just, yeah, it was the best possible start to it, because I kind of thought it was one down, just another few people to go. <laughs> 
And I know, like, obviously, you did this amazing map of the city. And I think you said you just had a few scribbles. And for him to mm. then come out with that, what was that like to see what was in your head out as this world you, you created? It, it was strange because I couldn't, when they said about doing a map, I mean, I know this is heresy, but I, I wasn't a massive fan of maps in books. And I know everyone else is a massive fan of maps in books, but I just tend to just flip past them. So I didn't realise there was such a thing about maps in books. And they said they want to do a map. And I was like, well, really? Because it's massive. I was imagining Pelican City as being the size of Paris or London, a huge city. And I was thinking, I'll never be able to kind of condense that into a map that will fit into the front of a book. And then they explained to me how maps in books work. <laughs> now they just pick out the key areas and, you know. <laughs> and anyway, so they said, send me the map you're working on that, and, and we will get him to create it from there. And I had to kind of send them a horrible, like a circle with some arrows coming out of it, basically, which is all I had. But it did teach me an important lesson about world building and how that isn't really enough. If you're going to orientate yourself around a world and expect the reader to, you need to, more than that, you need to kind of know this street leads to this street for consistency and all that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a good lesson for me. And yeah, and then he created an absolutely beautiful map, which was really kind of in a very stylish way. And everyone says they love the map, so. <laughs> he did well. Um, and it's, it's just brilliantly. such... It's just such an awesome city with this new gothic like feel. Is that a place you enjoyed hanging out in as a writer and creating? Yeah, I absolutely loved it. And actually, I kind of I, I do miss it now that I've had a bit of distance. I miss it because, you know, it's not necessarily the kind of city you'd want to live in um, because it's very kind of rain soaked and spooky and very corrupt. But I love reading um, old, the old hardball detective um, novels like Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler. And I just loved, I loved the kind of style, stylized nature, sort of nature of it. But also because I love Batman, I love the kind of Gotham aesthetic and Scooby-Doo and all that kind of stuff. It just lent itself to like a, a really strong picture in my mind about how it would look and feel and I think if you can kind of conjure that up for yourself it's a bit easier to conjure up for a reader so yeah I mean I could go back there in a in a second well you you have said about maybe doing an Abe mm -hmm. prequel is that something yeah, you're still sort yeah. of thinking about in yeah your mind? it's something I I think about sometimes I mean I've got I couldn't do it now but certainly at some point in the future I, I think about that and also um I had a great a bit of inspiration from a reader called Trudy who said was there any plans to do like a sequel, but several generations ahead. So imagining a couple of generations on from Lil Popkin's generation, like when maybe when they were the grown ups, uh, like the older people, what the town would be like there, how it would have changed. And I kind of thought that would be great actually. I love the idea of a another child maybe needing to find their legendary Nedley Stubbs, maybe the city's needs a hero again something like that so yeah I can easily get caught up in it if I start thinking about it too much but yeah well it's, it's when you've yeah. created something that you poured so much love and passion in you kind of want to keep mm. it don't you and yeah. when you say, yeah. I'm a big fan of Batman and I totally forgot when I was 10 I even had a Pat Batman swimsuit with like the little logo <laughs> and everything <laughs> Yeah, I was that's like, super cute <laughs> it is. I mean, I was reading your books I was like hell yes I love Batman I've yeah. forgotten about that like this yeah. like cute little swimsuit um you know when so for your granddad thought he could see ghosts and his mum mm. and you know you've yeah. always been fascinated with the unexplained was it just mm. really easy for you to conjure up this amazing character Nedley Stubbs it was kind of strange, actually, because you're right, I, I have always been interested in ghosts and the idea of ghosts. But when I was conjuring Nedley, what I wanted was a ghost that was, wasn't was scary, if you know what I mean, a ghost that you could, that could be a main character. And so it's kind of very poignant writing Nedley because always in my head was that, you know, Nedley has at some point died. And uh, yeah, I, what I loved was thinking about the things we associate with ghosts, the haunting type things and imagining it almost like the sort of social problems of being a ghost um, with Nedley, you know, gives people the creeps and also, you know, and, and making people feel uncomfortable is horrible. So it's, you know, awkward for him. Uh, he brings his cold atmosphere with him, all that kind of stuff. He was a great character to write. He was a difficult, he would have been a difficult main character 
because no one could really see him or hear him. So it would be hard for him to have a stronger effect on the plot. But yeah, it was, it's great to have written a ghost story that isn't a, a, a classic ghost story, if you know what I mean. It's a ghost story, it's slightly different. And as you say, it couldn't just be him. He had to team up with this awesomely fierce character who I think, you know, you kind of like so much, you wish you were like her. Tell us about yeah, Lil Popkin. Yeah. Yeah, Lil Popkin was, because I when I first started writing this, it was around 2013, 2012. And, you know, we had, we had austerity and, you know, all sorts of things happening in public services. And I felt very, you know, as, as, as many people did, very down about all that. So I, I kind of think Lil Popkin was not only the character that Nelly needed, she was a character that I needed. I needed someone to kind of step in and try and change things and not kind of just accept the way things are. So yeah, I mean, she's a great character to write because she kind of, she's got such a lot of agency and she she's not afraid to kind of question all the other characters and and make things happen, which is which is what you really want in a main character because they're driving the, the action on. So yeah, she was easy to write actually, Lil. Awesome. Is it all like to do a reading from the last book in the trilogy? Yeah, I, I would love to do a reading and I'd like to do it, yeah, from Ghost Catcher, which is book three. Now, Ghost Catcher came out uh, in March 2020, so it's been seldom read from. It's um, the only one I've so got I'll that you haven't a... signed, Sophie, so I need to get on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, book three, Ghost Catcher. Now, we first met Ghost Catcher at the end of book two. That's them there on the front cover. And they are a team of maverick scientists who are funded by City Hall to get rid of Pelican City's haunting problem. And they're focusing all of their intention on the, the capture of one spook now, which is one that the Herald, which is kind of the nefarious newspaper in Final Ghost. Um, but the Final Ghost is known to us as Nedley Stubbs. So in book three, uh, Lil is an apprentice reporter for the Klaxon and she's working with a journalist called uh, Marsha Quake and covering the ghost catcher story, which means she's tracking them so she can get one step ahead of the game and keep Nedley safe. But unbeknownst to Nedley, Lil has just scooped an interview with one of the ghost catcher scientists in which the scientist whose name is Magdalena Virgil has told Lil they now believe they have a 99% chance of capturing the final ghost. So it looks like Nedley's days might be numbered. Okay, so this is from chapter two. This is called The Final Ghost. The silver Mercury Coupe sped away through the city with Marsha Quake behind the wheel and Lil belted in beside her, riding low in the bucket seats. A police scanner was fitted onto the dashboard where the radio would normally be, and every few seconds Lil twisted the dial to check for signals in the static. The scanner had been on the blink ever since they pulled out of Chinatown due to the proximity of Nedley, who unbeknownst to Quake had tucked himself in to the narrow space behind Lil's seat and the parcel shelf. 99% chance, said Quake with a smirk. She had exchanged her dark glasses for clear ones and her long eyelashes shielded her green eyes as she stared through the unrelenting rain that was pelting the windscreen. We'll see. They're not even come close in weeks as far as I can tell. I don't believe them, Lil said stubbornly. They sounded pretty confident though, Quake mused. She clung expertly to the bends as they snaked south towards the river, her hands clad in tan leather driving gloves, the wind streaming through the rear window vents rippling her headscarf. A 99% chance of what? Nedley whispered right in Lil's ear, making her jump, which caused Quake to swerve the car, hitting the curb before bouncing back into the road. Lil shivered uncontrollably. Sorry, she said to Quake, giving Nedley a stern look out of the corner of her eye. I'm just a bit chilly. It's okay, said Quake, flicking a concerned glance at her and ramping up the car heater a couple of notches. I'm freezing too tonight. Sorry, Nedley winced, flattening himself back against the parcel shelf. Anyway, you have to hand it to them, Quake continued where she'd left off. Ghost catcher, I mean. They've had nothing but misses lately, yet they still seem to make it sound so inevitable, Lil murmured, and she stared out of the window at the glow of the city centre as it came into view like a single ember burning in a pit of black ash. I bet it's just talk. What's inevitable? Nedley persisted, leaning carefully forwards again. Lil flashed her eyes at him. Tell you later. Well, I hope they have something, said Quake, 
Otherwise, this story is going to run out of legs. This is the third false alarm this week. Apart from the fall in the serious crime rate immediately after they busted those ghosts at the doll hospital, the whole thing is starting to look thin on facts. Ghost catchers' own so-called readings are the only evidence there even is another ghost. But if that's true, then what's the problem? They caught the others easily enough. <laughs> Lil snorted at this and rolled her eyes comically at Nedley, who grinned and leant further forward again. Ghostcatcher had only ever caught one ghost, Mr. Grip. Lil, Abe, Margaret, Nedley and Naomi had got rid of all the others, but their part in the drama had remained secret. Quake sighed thoughtfully. Everything is pointing towards it being a hoax, except my instinct tells me that Pelican City is still haunted. Every now and again, things just feel really creepy and I can't explain it. She shivered violently. Nedley retreated as quickly as he could, tucking himself into the furthest corner. His arms were wrapped around his legs and his cheeks were dark with embarrassment. Lil tried to catch his eye, but he was staring fixedly out the window. She flumped back in her seat. If it's just the creeps and it's no big deal, is it? I mean, you wouldn't say it's doing any harm. Quake was quiet as she took the East Bridge over the Kalpai River and Lil looked out of the water, rippling grey in the moonlight. Finally, as they pulled into the slower traffic heading downtown, Quake spoke again. So what makes you think it's a he? What? Lil's ears flamed red. Just now, and talking to Virgil earlier, you asked what were their chances of catching him? I didn't mean anything by it. Could be a she, said Lil, just not an it. Quake considered this. There might be an interesting story in itself. If we could find out who the final ghost was before they died, then maybe we could work out how to catch it. Lil looked back over her shoulder. Nedley was still staring out of the small corner window as they passed beneath the streetlights. She turned back to Quake. You said yourself the serious crime rate had fallen. Nothing dangerously spooky has happened, so... She let the statement hang. Why don't they give it a rest? Then maybe we could work on something else. Quake dropped through the gears and pulled onto Spooner Row. She brought the Mercury to an abrupt standstill outside the Nightjar Cafe. Bored already? She gave Lil a jokey smile. Look, if the ghost is out there, then it's a story. If it's not out there and City Hall are knowingly using it as a distraction, it's a story. Either way, we have to follow where it leads. We're reporters. That's what we do. That's from chapter two. Awesome. Like amazing trilogy. Amazing. And I, I'm quite, quite tearful, actually, the ending. <laughs> um, Did I? Yeah, I was like... <laughs> Quite emotional, I'm like, sorry. Um, but I was typing and crying. Were you like, oh, this is beautiful? I was, yeah, um, yeah. absolutely gorgeous way. And you know, so many great characters. You know, it's not just Popkin Stubbs, it's not just Abe, you've got Minnie, the hot dog mm. lady, who I think <laughs> um was partially inspired by like an 80s TV series, Police Squad. Yes, yeah, the shoe shine guy who always yeah. had the kind of word off the streets. Yeah, absolutely. I love it how there's a, usually a character that can give people the inside track and Minnie yeah Minnie had a kind of poignant backstory herself but uh yeah she's and I think hot dogs you know because it's kind of a New Yorkie isn't it hot dogs so it gave her a reason to be out on the streets all the time. Awesome and we've had a question from Amy about what you're what you what you're next working on and I think there might be a bit of a sci-fi theme in that. Yeah, well, actually, I'm working on three different things at once at the moment. Yeah, and I can't tell you loads about any of them, except one of them is a sci-fi. One of them I'm researching Celtic mythology for. Ooh. And one of them is more to do with fairy tales and folklore. So, yeah, for, it's strange because I used to be a real one book girl. And if I was writing one book, I couldn't even think about another one. Now I found myself with lots of things going on at the same time but actually it feels like it's fine because they're so different which is what I like I, I'm not very good at um you know keeping to one genre because they're so different it feels like um yeah I can I can balance them because I know oh that's for that idea and that's for that book so yeah you like listening to music when you write so if you just got different playlists for each of these books yes you jack in and then start going yeah that's absolutely true. I do. Um, just 
if you're in Suffolk watching this, you will have Freegal on our website. And I make myself playlists using Freegal, which is a oh, great little yeah. downline. It has fantastic soundtracks on it. So, yeah, when I was writing um, Pogman Stubbs, I had loads of Thelonious Monk and Miles Davis and Duke Ellington in the background. Billie Holiday is my, probably my favourite. And then I, yeah, had some more things sort of sound tracks from things like Interstellar for the sci-fi and now I'm listening to you know The Last Kingdom the yeah what's that one you know it's on BBC yeah it's um her name's pronounced like a Avor I think it's pronounced anyway The Last Kingdom soundtrack is on the Freegal and I've been downloading all of those so yeah I think that having the soundtracks means I can because I don't have much time it means I can immediately immerse myself in that world or I can be on a train or somewhere, plug in and I'm just totally in that world then. So it's a real great shortcut. And also I find it a really exhilarating way into a story. And it is, for what you just said, is it a good way to like let your mind know which book it is? It's like a cue. Yeah, and this really is what I'm that. writing. Yeah, it really is that. Yeah, I was thinking as I was, I was out today listening to a song, I was thinking it makes it very difficult to listen to that music afterwards because it's so associated with a certain book which you've left behind. Um, but yeah, it is, it really does because they have to be different. I can't, I couldn't listen to the same playlist for a totally different genre. I don't know why, maybe it's some kind of head programming or something, but it seems to work like that, like a trigger. Like, I'm in that world, go, boom, 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 boom. Let's do this. Um, we've had a, a, a <laughs> note from Nimala who's he suggested you might be superhuman working, you know, you're a, you're a librarian for Suffolk Libraries. You're working on three different library projects. How on earth do you mm. do that and juggle all of that? Yeah, it is, it's weird. I was thinking about this today, actually, as well. I was thinking about how great it would be if my only job was writing and I could spend all my time thinking about my books. I have to accept that not having time maybe focuses my mind a bit better than otherwise. And maybe if I didn't have another job, I would spend a lot of time doing things which weren't properly writing. And also um, my other job really complements the writing job because I, I know lots about children's books. It's given me, a, it's grounded me. I know how it, that kind of stuff works. I know how, how, popular some books can be and how unpopular some books can be and I have to withdraw books you know and one day I may have to withdraw my own so that's good it keeps me in this you know it keeps me not not getting carried away but also yeah I, I, my enthusiasm for children's books is only fueled more by all the fantastic books I see coming in stock so yeah I can't really complain I do feel like it'd be nice to have some more spare time but as I love both jobs then you know and your colleagues are really awesome yeah some of them are okay <laughs> no they are really supportive i've had such great support from everyone and it does knowing there are people in your corner is game changing in terms of how you kind of run things um yeah no, i've been very lucky I love that when you just said about people in your corner, that's a really big theme for your uh, trilogy as well. You know, having people believe in you. Yeah. And again, Nimal has also asked like at the beginning, like when you wanted to, you know, you had this great story. How did you keep yourself going, mm. motivated to keep searching for an agent and a publisher? Like, yeah. what was that like? It was weird, actually, when I look back now, because I mean, I'm not trying to be a big head, but I really did think I was going to get published eventually. I just thought I had to stay in there long enough because I thought, you know, I don't, I don't think you can think otherwise because it takes too much time and too much energy. And if you didn't think it was going to go anywhere, then I don't know how you, I don't know how you would get motivated to do it. But also I think it's really the long game, you know, getting published, all of that stuff. What was frustrating is trying to get an agent because once you've got an agent, the agent helps you find a publisher. So finding a publisher is their problem once you've got the agent, but finding the agent, finding someone who will represent you, they will only take you on if they think they can sell your book because they don't get paid otherwise. So, you know, and and that was just really hard. And I just had to keep, what, what I would say to anyone in the same boat is, I, you know, the first few times I sent it out, I watched by, by the, you know, by the mailbox, waiting every day, like, oh, well, actually, it was the internet. It was the inbox by the time I was doing that, not the 
romantic mailbox. Um, but, you know, I, I was so wrapped up in whether I'd get an answer and sometimes it was weeks and sometimes it was less. And by the end, I was just sending it out like, boom, another rejection, bang, send it out again. You know, I think you just you can't take them personally because the agents are looking very specifically for things they can sell now or, you know, and so, yeah. And actually, by the time I got my book picked up by an agent, it, yeah, that was just a friend, like a friend of the family almost. It was like he wasn't even like sending it out cold. So I would recommend people going to things like writing, um, you know, doing MAs, doing our album courses, anything that could get you in touch with anyone who knows anyone really helps because, you know, there's so many thousands of people writing books. You just kind of need an in if you're outside of that agency, you know, outside of that industry, which most of us are. So, yeah. And also, like you've talked about, like the persistence of, of this is what I want to do. So I'm going to find mm. a, a way, a route. And that's been a really common theme during this festival. So for like kids watching, if you if you love writing, you love drawing, you're like, keep going with it. And, yeah. you know, you never know what might happen. And mm. if it's a dream. Yeah then like cultivate that and put in, you know, like you said, you put a lot of hard work in behind it yeah. um, to get where you are now. And when you just said about like getting the agent, I know obviously Piccadilly Press like really took on board mm. your vision. Was that when you then did yeah. get that publisher, was it really lovely yeah. that they totally got it? Yeah, it was great because I had kind of worried that, you know, it wasn't very commercial and that maybe they would say, well, can you change this or make it more like this? And I would, it would lose something. I was really worried about that. And they weren't like that at all. They really not. They were right behind it. And I think that's, I'm not sure if that's rare or normal because that's my only experience so far, but it was fantastic. I, I remember having a really great editorial meeting with the, with my main editor, who's called Emma. And, it, you know, we, we were problem solving it and bouncing ideas off each other. And it was just, it's great to kind of work in a team where they're really behind the idea. You're not kind of, because I think, it, I think I would argue some of the decisions I'd made if I had to, because I feel like you have to feel that strongly about what you write, but I actually didn't have to, any of them. So that's great. It's awesome. And I'm not sure, I can't see her. Is um, Sister Abbott with you? Or could you tell us about her? Mm. Sister Abbott is with me. Oh, she hidden just behind you yes always creepily sitting behind me this is which way do we go this way this is sister abbott who was the character of wool was based on this so the only thing she doesn't have like wool is the blinking eye wool has one winking eye which way am i going that way um yeah i mean very incredibly creepy toy but i can't you know i do love creepy toys so uh yeah and I think um, your mum was giving it. So it's it's as old as you. Actually, yeah, well, actually, I was given it when I was born by yeah. the nurse who named it after herself. The nurse was called Sister Abbott. And she made this for me back in the days when, when I was born in a hospital in Halesworth. And my mum was in there for a week. It was back in the days when you had long, you know, periods of kind of, you know, support after you had a baby and the nurses had time to like knit you cool things like this and uh yeah my mum actually made me oh for those of you who are watching this who have had a school visit for me this is son of wool this is um kind of the one i take out with me because it's less fragile and, and much less creepy there's still a little, um yeah uh my mum my mum did make this one for me that's awesome and i i love that and obviously then bring that into your books so I'm going to get all book, all three books. So, one, two, and obviously Sophie's latest one and last mm. in the trilogy, but you never mm. know, mm. Um, Ghost Catcher. It's awesome. As we talked about, you know, it's got this sort of Batman, your film feel. There's amazing characters and you can get your very own copy of this book and the rest. One way. I'll get that. The rest <laughs> of the trilogy 
from Sophie's website, which you're going to be directed to in just a moment. And the time has flown by, but thank you everyone for joining us, either live or catching up on our YouTube channel. We're always so grateful for your support as a charity. Our last book festival event for this children's festival is tomorrow with Ellie Griffiths. Join us if you can. And all of our amazing services and events on our website, including some spectacular children book lists by the wonderful Sophie and on that Sophie thank you so much I'm so glad that we got to do this um thank you so much for having me and thanks everyone for joining us it's very lovely to see you virtually